Live from the Moscone Convention Center in San Francisco, California, it's The Q at Oracle Open World 2014. Brought to you by headline sponsor QLogic with support from HGST, Violin Memory, and Mark Logic. And now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. Hi everybody, we're back at Oracle Open World 2014. We're here live at Moscone South inside the QLogic booth, year five for us at Oracle Open World. Jeff Kelly is with me. Jeff, great to see you. Uh, really great happy to, to have you here. We're going to roll into the afternoon with your perspectives. Good friend Brian Bulkowski is here. He's the CTO and one of the founders of Aerospike. Longtime Cube guest and good friend of the Cube. Brian, welcome back. Good to see you again. Well, thanks a lot. It's always good to be on the Cube. Yeah, so Oracle Open World, Oracle, let's start with Oracle in transition. Let's just you know, start there. Um, I, I often sort of say tongue in cheek, Oracle will be late to a, a trend and then kind of act like they invented it and we're seeing it now with the excellent Oracle marketing with 12C and one click to the cloud. Um, what's really going on in the Oracle world? Well, I, I think everyone's realized, hopefully everyone's realized, that the days of selling software are numbered. Right, the idea that you're going to actually buy a piece of software and install it somewhere, the writing's on the wall. No developer, no, no software engineer really wants to install software anymore. They simply want it to be there. And Amazon has paved the way. Azure, part of that, all the PaaS guys, um, you know, the, uh, what Salesforce did with Heroku, those are all paths on the way to, I don't ever want to install software. I want to have an environment. I want to trust that environment. I want that environment to work. Well, I mean, Salesforce kind of had that vision in 1999, right? No software, and, and here it is 2014. Um, now, it, I, it seems like from a business model standpoint, Oracle's genuinely accepting that. Uh, cloud business is growing. Stafford talks on the quarterly conference calls about how committed they are to wrapping hardware and software together, II infrastructure as a service, PaaS, uh, database as a service, uh, software as a service, the whole nut. Can the new stuff, in your opinion, grow fast enough to offset the decline in the old stuff? I think it's going to be hard to get anyone to switch over to Oracle's cloud because data has gravity. Once you have your data in one place, shifting it, going back and forth with that data, it's very difficult, and this is where Amazon and EC2 has really stolen a march on so much of the world. People's data is in Amazon. Getting that stuff out of Amazon is going to be a trouble, right? So the people who are already in Azure, et cetera. So uh, the tweet that I saw was that Am Google, uh, sorry, that uh, Oracle is starting this with like 20,000, 30,000 machines for their cloud. That's only going to be the diehards, right? The people who are, you know, ah, I'm going to use Oracle no matter what compared to the millions of machines that EC2 has and the millions of machines that Google has as part of Google Compute Engine. So, so I think it's going to be a little tough other than the diehard guys. Well, I think you know, that bring up a good point. I mean, from a, from a strategy standpoint, they can get the diehards into the cloud, but the scale is not, and, and or Larry said last night, we're going to compete on price with Google and Amazon and Microsoft. How do they do that without having that massive scale? I, I don't think price is the issue. I, I think he threw that away. It was a great giveaway. I mean, it, yeah, I'll compete on price, but developers want scale. They want ease of scaling. They want APIs that they already know and love. I think this is the, the benefit of what Pivotal's done um, with, with OpenStack and OpenCloud. OpenStack allows you to say, hey, you get your same APIs. Uh, I'm a little confused as why Oracle wouldn't line up behind that effort, that really being the anti-Amazon uh, move at this point, as opposed to setting their, uh, up their own system. Well, they're kind of taking an, an Amazon-like strategy and just building it out through the full red stack and saying, all right, we're going to be the red stack, do everything Amazon, Amazon does, plus, and yeah, forget that, you know, open. Which, which makes cloud, sense, so. because they have their own application environment, right. you know, all of the, they do have, in fact, a full stack soup to nuts. Um, whether that's enough, I think that's the question. Well, they definitely see the world differently. Well, let's, let's talk about Aerospike. Give us the update on, on Aerospike. We've, um, it's been a while since you and I talked, and uh, love to hear what's new with you guys. So the biggest thing in Aerospike is that we open sourced all of our software. Yep. So the fact that the Aerospike database is now open source, we would like anyone who's considering Redis or one of the older in-memory solutions to really look at Aerospike. 
We've been trusted for in-memory deployments throughout ad tech, marketing tech, uh, with a great suite of customers. So five plus years in deployments with very high availability systems, extraordinary performance, and now with open source, we think any developer really should just reach for a proven system in in-memory. So why the decision to open source and, and why now? So in our original idea of the business, we wanted to make sure that we had a great beachhead and a great piece of technology. So for our initial investors, we said, we're going to keep it focused. As a small company, we want to land into a market, we want to hit user data within advertising and make a great product for those guys. And then later stage, you say, okay, now we want adoption. And we're starting to see that. So the guys at Datastax are now saying, this is the year of NoSQL in the enterprise. We see that at Aerospike. We see telecom companies doing QoS-based routing for which they need an in-memory database. That has to be right on the front line. We're seeing um, financial services companies trying to respond to mobile and the demands that that has. There's this core database, position of, data, uh, position of record database, has to be in memory uh, and it has to be very high reliability. We're seeing those use cases pop up. We're seeing uh, stacks that used to be a storage device, a database, and then a cache we're seeing all of that slim down to just the database. Wouldn't you rather have a database that was fast enough and didn't require a storage layer, didn't require cache in front of it? All of those, the enterprise seems to be responding to that, and so for broad adoption, we believe open source is the answer. This is a flattening of that uh, pancake stack. <laughs> Jeff, what do you take, what's your take on all this? I mean, in-memory database has been around ever since that I've been in the business, and now all of a sudden, Things are you know, exploding again. What's your take? Sure, on? well, I mean, the price of memory has come down significantly. You've got flashes enabling uh, some similar capabilities but at a, at a lower price point. Um, so I think it's certainly an area where there's a lot of interest around putting those applications right at the front line. So you're actually making real-time uh, recommendations, real-time um, insights that are enabling users to actually get more from the application that they're interacting with. And we were talking, Brian, a little bit just before we went on, on air about, uh, you mentioned finally this is the year of kind of real time. Uh, talk a little bit about that, both in terms of the use cases where Aerospike excels, as well as some of the things we're seeing on the Hadoop side with Spark and some other things. So the big use case that I'm starting to see coming out of the Spark community, by the way, I'm, we're as excited about Spark as anyone else. I think it's a really interesting architecture. And what it seems to be used for from, from people I talk to is looking for things like patterns using machine learning in real time. So instead of having to sweep through all of your data with Hadoop, and you might have tens of petabytes that might take six hours, what about, what if I can see those patterns right now? What if I can see an interruption in my cloud services? What if I can see out of my server logs a certain class of users just starting to hit right now? That's what all that stuff is great for. Now, Airspike's role in that, first of all, we may be able to improve uh, Spark simply because a shared database, as opposed to in memory on the Java stack, may provide some interesting computation. And so we're working with the guys at Databricks on that and trying to figure out our own solution, that's great. But the, the real point is you want to make all of these insights part of your online experience. You want to offer a deal. You want to offer a cross-sell, upsell. You want to offer a recommendation, and that's in the web experience. It can't be batched. You want to line it up right now. You want to see the insight with a system like Spark, and then you want to feed it into the online experience. That's what gives, um, gives people the feeling that you're listening to them and personalizing everything as part of the web experience. So take us back a little bit. Give us a little bit of a history lesson, because we know, of course, that kind of personalized advertising has been around for a while, but it hasn't always been this real time. It's been more batch oriented. Talk a little bit, of, walk, walk us through the history of how this has evolved a little bit. Sure, so uh, if you remember around year 2000, the idea of scaling out the internet was, let's get a whole bunch of MySQL, let's shard it out, let's put a cache in front of it, let's buy ourselves a storage layer and a you know, sand behind it. And that sort of took us through to, I would say around 2007, 2008. Mm -hmm. The large internet companies like Google never even went that direction, really. It was the, you know, the, the guys trying to build internet experiences. So in 2008, something very interesting happened in technology, which was the personalization of advertising. Instead of taking an ad, buying an ad on a website, or buy, like buying a ad on a magazine page, people said, hey, let's, let's try to buy an audience. Let's try to try, buy a person. And then they said, well, wait a minute, we have to price this. So if I can get your eyeballs right now, maybe on some wacky site that you go to, you know, driving cars in the mud, who knows what, um, but I'm buying you, how do I price the opportunity to get an ad in front of this particular person at this particular time? And a couple of smart guys said, hey, let's run auctions. Auctions are the only fair way of pricing 
the millions per second of ads that can be delivered at any moment. So companies like AppNexus out of New York, the Trade Desk on the West Coast, and Google internally, and also Facebook now as part of Facebook Exchange said, let's run auctions. So this is very interesting because it provides a counterpoint to capital markets. Capital markets, when you trade and you buy and sell, you say, I'm willing to buy, I'm willing to sell, and when those two points overlap, then you've got a sale. Instead, you say, I want to sell, let's run an auction, and let's do that today, that's happening in advertising, three million times every second, with a hundred companies bidding on every single advertisement. Mm -hmm. It is a massive piece of technology to price in real time every single ad opportunity. Facebook does it as part of Facebook Exchange, um, Google's ads flow out, all of these systems. Well, so the, the, the players you mentioned are obviously huge technology companies. They're big web-based companies. So they have the wherewithal and the, obviously the, the need to do that. Um, so what about the rest, of the rest of the world that could benefit from that kind of um, capability? How do they get access to that kind of technology, that kind of, those kind of capabilities? Well, this is one of the reasons we formed Aerospike. We wanted to bring the kind of technology that was inside Google, allowing them to scale, out into other companies. So, you know, Oracle, we're here at Open World. I mean, Times 10 was a great memory database. And yet the people I talk to using Times 10 say, oh, but it doesn't scale. We know it doesn't scale. Um, and you know, I'm not a Times 10 user, I can't speak to that eloquently, but what we did at Aerospike was we said, let's use the in-memory technology that companies like Google are using, like Yahoo are using internally on their own projects, let's bring that to a wider market and allow people to compete with these kinds of in-memory solutions. Mm -hmm. Now beyond, obviously you've got to have the technology component, but you've also got to have the, the use cases, the understanding from the enterprise about what can be done with this technology. You mentioned the number of the, you know, the millions of transactions per second to a more traditional enterprise. That might seem like, well, where is that going to fit with me? How am I going to leverage that? What are some of the things you're seeing in maybe some other industries, or how are you educating you know, customers, potential customers, about the capabilities? Yeah, it's a great question, because I do think now is the time when the traditional enterprise, the Fortune 50, the Fortune 500, is getting hip to this. Um, but let's not forget, you know, Fortune, what? Where is Apple in the fortune stack? Apple knows this, and Apple is beating the market, and so is Amazon, by presenting personalized experiences. Anyone who's competing with, with uh, Apple as part of their online store systems, or is competing with Walmart and Walmart Labs, they have great technology in all of these areas. If you're competing as a retailer with any of these companies or with Amazon, you need these kinds of deals. You need real-time pricing. You need real-time stocking. Mm -hmm. Rolling those out requires an in-memory database today. Mm -hmm. so, so let's take the retail example. I'm a small retailer. Am I, should I go directly to somebody like Aerospike or to, to a similar you know, vendor, or are there service companies that are kind of playing the middleman role? How do I actually go about and do that? You'll go to a service provider. Mm -hmm. So what we at Aerospike do is we get that technology out to a variety of service providers who are creating the kind of recommendation engines that then a smaller retailer might use as a service. Mm -hmm. ah, so you're selling into those service providers who play the, play the role of, hey, we're going to build a platform um, using Aerospike technology that, that, that does some of the things that Google's platform can do, that Facebook can do, and then we're going to make that available to all their competitors so they can actually compete in this market. Absolutely. Cool. So Brian, how has the decision to go op open source um, changed the way you guys operate, changed your business model, and specifically, um, how are you interacting with the developers, you know, same, differently, in a more enhanced way? So open source has opened doors for us across the industry. When we had gone into even, we found there was a big sea change, a big shift, market shift, uh, in talking to say the Fortune 100 and even Fortune 200 about any kind of platform. So we said, you know, look, you guys know you need an in-memory data platform, right? And they would go, yeah, yeah, we need that stuff. And then they would say, but it needs to be open source. They would just start about that. They, they would say, well, we're, we're not willing to get trapped into any kind of data platform. If you want to be our data platform of the future, we need to be able to see the code and read the code. We'll still pay you money. It wasn't about money. And that was early when we were talking about cloud. It's not about price, right? It's really about trust. It's about understanding the technology. It's about seeing how that technology works. That's why these guys want open source. They're still happy to pay for it. They want a company behind it to support it. And I think a lot of the other NoSQL companies are seeing that too. It's been the dominant paradigm for new databases, and correctly so. Right, okay, so the business model really hasn't changed dramatically. No, it hasn't. Uh, they're still paying you, uh, but they just get open, uh, open access to the code. And, and how about the contribution side? Is that picked up? Or what are your so, objectives there? You know, one, one last quip was that open source is the new escrow. Yeah. 
So in the old days, you know, <laughs> the old days, which is to say a few years ago, you would, we would write all of our contracts that said, hey, you're going to get, uh, you know, in case of some unfortunate thing, say for example, Oracle buying Aerospike as a company, then you know that would trigger an escrow agreement. Um, now we just say, look, you don't have to worry about all that. We're open source. You're covered in case of any eventuality. That's really what they want is is the new escrow. Um, second of all, in terms of contributions, we're not too worried about that. We have great software engineers. They understand our system. We get a few contributions, especially in client side, client side libraries. We haven't seen very many for the server yet, and you know that's okay with us. Really, it's about escrow. It's about trust. Open source is the new escrow. I'm right, Brian Bukowski. Thanks very much for coming on the cube. Always really a sharp segment. Uh, really appreciate your insights. Great. Thanks a lot. Great to All be right. here. All right. Keep it right there, everybody. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is the cube. We're live at Oracle Open World 2014 in Moscone. We'll be right back.